All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the WLS AM 890 Sound Lounge. Today we have a very special Q&A event that we have dubbed Hot Seat with Rick Hahn. And now let's give a warm welcome to White Sox pre- and post-game show host, Connor McKnight. First and foremost, thanks everybody for being here. This is awesome. I'm glad everybody could make it. Uh, I'm glad everybody learned how to text into the post-game show and win your tickets. Thank you so much for doing that. And a big thanks to, uh, to Rick Hahn for being here with us and hanging out with us for a little while. I know uh, this season for the White Sox has been honestly and truly an incredibly interesting one to watch. And this is the man who has pulled the strings on everything that's gone on for the White Sox this year. And I think very clearly, there are a lot of things to get excited about. So, Rick, thanks so much for being here. Well, thanks for having me. And it's nice, you know, in a year where we're very likely going to wind up with the worst record in the American League and top three pick, that there's this level of enthusiasm. So thank you, Connor. Absolutely. For, uh, Absolutely. Emphasizing the positive here in that intro. Well, let me, let me ask you this then. We'll start with this. We were talking about this on the way up to, well, I guess, I guess a, a schedule of events first. We talked, Rick and I, in the back of the, the sound lounge here, and uh, between my questioning which Led Zeppelin album it was on the back wall and whether or not it had Stairway on it, uh, we decided that we're going to do a quick 10 minutes of Q&A with you guys since you made the, shoot, since you made the trip all the way down here. So if you have questions for Rick, um, feel free. You can put, oh no, I can, it's, thank you so much. It's very nice for you. Uh, if you have questions for Rick, you know, start formulating those now. We'll hand out a microphone toward the end of the event. And, uh, and you can fire those cues to the, to the hot seat here. And exceptionally warm, the seat, dealing with it? I've had worse, but okay. we got time. Kind of we got time. So our, our season is coming to an end, Rick, and your manager, Ricky Renteria, just yesterday walked into the pregame press conference with all the White Sox beat reporters. He was, by all accounts, bouncing off the walls, ready to get out there and work with his guys, ready to get there and teach those lessons. We are less than two weeks from the end of the season. To contrast that, I have not done laundry in two weeks, and I am currently using the broken down box of a new Glarus sampler instead of a bath mat. So all I'm saying is I could, I could do something with the time. On that spectrum, where are you at as we approach the end of this season and things to do on your inbox with the White Sox general manager's desk? I did laundry on the office. That's good. I'm glad. I'm that's, happy for that's you. That's what you're getting at. I'm happy for you. Uh, you know, it's a quieter time right now, September. Obviously, we had a pretty frenetic pace going, starting with the winter meetings last year and, and obviously through the trade deadline and the draft and our international signing period. And then it sort of hits this wall here where there's no longer any trades as teams are setting their postseason rosters, and we basically have stripped down everything of short-term value uh, and, and sent it off to, for the greater good of the long term that for the last few weeks, I've just been sort of sitting back and watching the team play. We had a, we had a couple of teams uh, in our minor league system in Kannapolis and Great Falls go on postseason runs. So I was out in Kannapolis for a few days watching them and, and sort of getting a little glimpse of the future. But right now, from a, from a front office standpoint, we're getting ready for organizational meetings, which will take place starting next week. And then come October, we're going to put our plans to, heads together, come up with a plan for this offseason or how we're going to execute this offseason's plan and uh, hopefully keep the ball moving here towards what we're ultimately shooting for. How, how much of the off-season plan it is exists now? And I'm, you guys are going to do some work on it and change things around. How, how much of it is what you thought it would be 14 months ago when you sat down in the winter meetings as you were in that flight, you know, heading down there, knowing that you were going to set the White Sox on, that you had all, you and Kenny and Jerry had talked about sending the White Sox down an organization-changing path for the long-term future? You know, it, it's, we are essentially on pace of where we expected to be. And I think it's because we had fairly aggressive aspirations in terms of what we wanted to accomplish. We knew that something had to change. We knew we had to commit fully to one direction, and that obviously being uh, the rebuild, not the band. Uh, and either way, I mean, that's either way, very talented. Either way, great group to commit to. The breakup uh, was tough for me. I don't know how you wore it. But. We're now down a rabbit hole. I don't want to continue down, Connor. Uh, but we knew we was going to have to start with moving some very difficult decisions. Moving guys like Chris Sale or Adam Eaton or Jose Quintana is never easy. There was a great deal of uh, 
pride within the organization, whether it was within our amateur scouting department for uh, taking a guy like Chris or our uh, pro scouting department for identifying guys like Quintana and, and Eaton, uh, all three of whom our front office signed to what is arguably favorable club favorable contracts that when each one of these players had success, everyone from our scouts to our front office to our coaches felt a great deal of pride. And we knew moving players like that was going to hurt on some level, but there was going to be reason to be excited about what was coming back through that door. And as we've gotten to the point now, where as I alluded to, we've made most of the major transactions along those lines, uh, we are very pleased with where things sit. Now, in terms of the off-season plan, we are probably, again, each of these off-seasons, last off-season, this off-season, and, and the one coming 18-19, all sort of fit in to this grand plan. And unfortunately, at least for me, we are probably entering the most difficult phase. Because as much as it hurts to move a guy like Chris Sale or Adam Eaton or Quintana or Todd Frazier, any of the players that we let go, uh, we could see tangible benefits in terms of Eloy Jimenez or Yohan Mankata or Michael Kopech or whomever we acquired coming back in and how that fit to the overall ultimate goal of winning a championship. Now we're in the point of the, uh, where the offseason is really going to be based upon player development. And a lot of what happens over the next 12-ish months or so of this process is going to require a lot of patience. We're going to have to allow these players the time to develop. I'm sure uh, you heard from numerous callers, I will assume, on the postgame show about why isn't Moncada up? Why isn't Giolito up? Why isn't Lopez up? When each of them were excelling in AAA. I think now that we've seen how they've been able to acclimate themselves in Moncada, especially after early struggles, how they've been able to acclimate themselves in the big leagues, people sort of understand a little bit better why we were patient with these players, wanting to make sure they were fully equipped to succeed at that next level and to contribute at the major league level once they were called up, not just survive, but grow and adapt and become the championship caliber players they're capable of becoming. As many guys as we still have in this pipeline, far, far more than just the Moncada, Giolito, uh, Lopez's that we've already brought up, it's going to require similar such patience. And people are going to want to see Michael Kopech. People are going to want to see Eloy Jimenez. They're going to want to see Dane Dunning or whomever. Pick a, pick a name. Uh, but we're going to have to exhibit that same level of patience here over the next 12 to 18 months so that when they come, they can have similar such, such success as these first three and we can continue to move the entire organization forward. So you've, you've mentioned that phase one really is largely over. I mean, I, you turn the phases however you like, more or less. But for fans, that changes. And we've talked about this some, too. For fans, that changes the reticle, right? It changes exactly how fans get to watch for the future of this club. While there are certainly a number of prospects that got called up and a lot of good reasons to watch the future and, and development of White Sox baseball, what are the advice? What is what would be your advice for how to watch some of these kids as they come up through the levels? Because watching for trades and you know following Ken Rosenthal on Twitter and like logging on to MLB.com and seeing that the White Sox are in talks with everyone in baseball is I mean that's a jolt of adrenaline for fans, and this will be in a lot of ways harder for you, like you mentioned, but for fans a downshift. Do you have advice as to how to handle that? No, it's a good question because you're right. There's a bit of a jolt of adrenaline for, for myself, for the front office, for all of us associated with the club as you are engaged in these talks and you're seeing how you're able to access certain level of talent that's going to help us over the long term. Uh, now, again, it's, it's going to be about player development. It's going to be a little harder to uh, evaluate that simply because, yes, you can all see the, the Instagram videos of Eloy Jimenez predicting he's going to get hit a home run and then going out and hitting a home run. He's the best. He's the best. And that gets everyone very excited, and as well it should be. But there's an element of player development that involves failure, and it's a little bit perverse in that uh, all of us who are White Sox fans in this room remember Gordon Beckham and Gordon Beckham's rapid ascent through the minors and rampant uh, ascent into the big leagues where he came in, I think, third for rookie of the year after yeah. being up only for four months. We also, unfortunately, all remember Gordon Beckham's struggles that came at the big league level because it was for the first time in his career he actually failed. And adjusting on the fly at the big leagues is the hardest thing to do. And for a guy like Beckham, I think one of the reasons that he struggled a little bit with the adjustment and, quite frankly, probably never really made it, was that he really wasn't equipped ever to having dealt with failure and having pulled himself out of the bowels of despair and the ability to show, I know how to survive. I'll get back to being the player I once was. 
it is much, much easier for these players. Inevitably, they're all going to fail at some point in the big leagues. It's a tough league. They make adjustments. <laughs> the best the best play there. Uh, they have to be equipped with the tools to know, not only the tools to make adjustments on their own, but the self-confidence to know that they've been here before and they've gotten out of it before. So while people, there's some people within White Sox Nation who put it, point at Zach Collins' year this past year in Winston. Yeah, an interesting one. And uh, Zach was our first round pick a year ago. He's, uh, by all reasonable projections, he's our catcher of the future. Uh, and catchers, as a, as a species, develop very oddly. Right. They have to worry about the defense. They have to worry about working the pitching staff. And sometimes that costs them a little bit of offensive performance along the way. Zach still hit for power, still got on base, and made great, great strides in his defensive receiving and game calling. Overall, that's a successful year. His batting average was low, and for the first half of the season, he struck out a little bit more than everybody wanted. People look at that, and there's a natural reaction of, oh, wait, Zach Collins isn't developing the way everyone wants. He's not on pace to help us you know, in 2019 sure. or whenever you had him projected to be part of that lineup. The reality is, is part of player development is Zach Collins failing. And I'd much, much rather have that happen in the Carolina League because when it happens in Chicago, he's going to be equipped with the ability to pull himself out of it. So this is a long-winded way of saying the net, part of what a fan needs to help it, uh, themselves understand is that all these guys are not going to linearly or develop along a linear pace where they all shoot up through the big leagues and never suffer any failure. That's number one. The ones that do might not be better off for it. They might have been better off for having a little bit of failure along the way. Now, again, I'm not going to sit up here and say every one of our prospects in, in uh, the farm system that we've accumulated are all going to max out and hit the max of their ability. Right. That's part of the reason we wanted volume. That's part of the reason we weren't going to take any half measures when we were making these trades. We had to get up to a critical mass of prospects and need to continue to add to that because in inevitably the baseball gods are going to take a couple of them from us. They're going to get hurt. They're going to underperform. or yeah. God knows what's going to happen, and we're going to have to remove them from our plans. However, those that maybe suffer some temporary failures along the way could well be better served for it. So let's go to the flip side of that spectrum then. If, if the one side is prospects who inevitably will fail at some point, prospects who may be using a busted down uh, beer sampler as a bath mat, to the other side where, like Ricky Renteria, just have this boundless amount of enthusiasm and or, for the purposes of this analogy, are prospects that haven't really quite failed because you do have two who, at least off the top of my head, haven't hit a whole lot of roadblocks so far. Michael Kopak has been having a absolutely phenomenal year through two levels. Um, and an aggressive promotion it was to bring him out of spring and throw him in double A. Um, Aloy Jimenez, who was picked up in the Jose Quintana trade, one of the top prospects in baseball, and another reason why uh, the depth is impressive in the White Sox system, as is the top end, all he's done is hit. So. What have the White Sox learned, I suppose, whether it's via Gordon Beckham or just via other lessons, about prospects who do rocket through the, the minor leagues and do arrive with, you know, kind of this nuke Lelouch feel? You know, we need to completely understand the limitations of every player. And every player has limitations. There are going to be certain things they're not capable of doing. When people were clamoring for Moncada mm -hmm. to either break camp with us or mm -hmm. come up April 20th or May 20th, the reason he didn't is because he had not checked every box we wanted him to check at the minor league level. There are certain things, and on Mancata specifically, there was a few things with his right-handed swing, and there was also on the exchange on a double play, an arm slot issue. Not the end of the world. Certainly things that he could have come up to Chicago and survived with an unnatural arm slot on a double play, or he could have continued to have a little bit of a hole in his right-handed swing. But we wanted to take the time, and, and frankly, knowing what kind of a season we were going to have at the big league level, we have the luxury of taking the time to make sure that they've answered every, checked every box, so to speak, that we have for them at the minor league level. Now, there's certain things that you can't replicate. You can't rep in the minors. You can't replicate the speed of the game. You can't replicate the adjustments that pitchers make. You can't re replicate the, the nastiness of a breaking ball. Right. So when Moncada came up, he was able to do, he was able to essentially master and you know, frankly, come close to going through the motions at AAA and still have success. When we brought him up, it was to challenge him at that next level. And he did struggle initially with breaking balls. And he's going to continue to struggle a little bit with breaking balls. But it was the kind of breaking ball now that's giving him trouble he couldn't see in Charlotte. So we, we wanted to do with a guy like Moncada or whether it's Jimenez or Kopech, Kopech needs to throw more change-ups. 
If until he does that, he's not coming to Chicago. Once he starts doing that on a more regular basis and he's working that in, he's using the same arm motion and it's becoming a plus pitch for him, all right, maybe we'll test that with some big league hitters. But until he does it against minor league hitters, he's not coming. Uh, Jimenez, it's a little tougher to poke a hole in his, but he does have only about you know 20 some odd games above the A ball level. So we're going to give him a little chance to continue to show he can dominate, and maybe that'll give me a little time to find a flaw. That's, in his that's game. convenient. That's uh, convenient. That's... But he's, he's going to take a little longer. But the, the the overarching notion is we're going to have an objective goal sheet or a, a analysis of what a player is capable of doing. How much of that is, are they able to address at the minor league level? And once they've addressed all that, they're ready for a promotion, but not until then. But again, that doesn't mean they're finished products. Moncada's not a finished product. Even with this hot streak, you know, he's got his OPS closer to 800, which is where you'd probably reasonably project it as a 22-year-old. He's not a finished product, and he's going to continue to be challenged at the big league level. He's going to continue to develop at the big league level. And then when this team's ready to win, we think he's going to be a stalwart in the middle of that lineup. I mean, the White Sox are playing a team right now who has a player, though he's unconventional, certainly developed in big ways throughout his major league career in Jose Altuve. The guy's got a really good chance to win the AL MVP this year, likely think he will, despite the fact that he's five foot two. And I, I think that's a kind of case in point, which you're not that, you know, let's not put everybody on the same level as Jose Altuve. You, you mentioned the boxes, right? We've got to check boxes down in the minor leagues. You mentioned mostly baseball boxes, you know, a hole in the right-handed swing, an arm slot here, there. You've talked a lot, um, I think it was about a month ago, sat down with some uh, beat reporters and talked a lot about also evaluating and making sure that you've got the right guys for this rebuild, the intangibles mm -hmm. of building a clubhouse, of building chemistry, this stuff that is ethereal and doesn't fit into baseball reference, right? How have the ways that your front office evaluates those kind of things changed over the last couple of years what what did we think then that we were wrong about you know how have we what what bubbles have we burst well makeup is the toughest which is essentially what you're you're the the simple word for what you're the, describing the is makeup, makeup right yeah, makeup on the 2080 how hard a guy's going to work how much he's willing to make adjustments how good of a leader he is how good of a teammate he is what he does off the field how focused he is all that stuff we throw in a bucket and call it makeup that's the toughest thing to evaluate until you have a player. Our scouts, our amateur scouts, our pro scouts who go around the minor leagues are charged with trying to figure out as much as they can. But until you're sitting this close to a guy and seeing him pregame every day, seeing how he shows up in the clubhouse, seeing how he interacts, you don't know for sure. When you say you have, do you mean, just for clarity's sake, at the 25-man roster level no, or no, no, just no, in, no, the no, in the organization? In the organization. In the organization. Sure. Jake Berger at Missouri State yeah. looks like a hell of a leader. His teammates love him. His coaches speak well of him. The coaches from other teams, the radio guy speaks right. well of him. You dig as deep as you can to get to know him. You, you have an interview with him, but they're all polished and coached by then. Uh, the, get to know the family a little bit, what they're about. And you make an educated guess. These guys have been doing it for a long time, so they get pretty good at evaluating, you know, separating who's legit or who's not. Uh, we do view it as, in order to succeed in Chicago, given the market, given White Sox fans, uh, you need to be someone who is not only totally committed to doing everything in your personal power to win a championship, but you're also going to protect your teammates. Because not on any, on any given day, all 25 of you aren't going to be hitting on all cylinders. Sure. And you have to be able to buy into our program and believe in our program and follow with Ricky and our coaches and fit into our culture and help guys pull guys along who may not be able to do it for themselves that day. Uh, that's pretty touchy-feely. That, that comes with first having the raw ingredients, that raw makeup to want to be a winner and make the sacrifices it requires to be a winner. But then once you're in part of the organization, buying in to what we teach and how we want to play the game and the selfless approach to winning baseball, that's the stuff we can evaluate once we get you. And I, over the years, I wouldn't say as if we've missed on that necessarily. I go back to the 05 team with A.J. Perzinski and, and Bobby Jenks, both of whom were you know, left for dead for makeup reasons by other organizations, so to speak. Uh, and we were willing, based on the research we did, to take mm -hmm. a chance on them. So it wasn't a great chance. It was an easy chance based on what we dug up. Uh, and obviously, we don't win without either of those guys. Uh, you know, they're not all going to be Canerco in terms of sort of the stoic leader type. They're not all going to be the, the Pruszynski or Rowan sort of uh, hair on fire leader type. But they're all going to be, 
ideally focused on the same singular goal and willing to make the selfless sacrifices required for the team to reach that goal. Is, is trying to quantify that stuff a good idea or a bad idea? Is it, can you throw a Myers-Briggs test at an 18-year-old who's coming into the draft and figure out something about that guy? Because we've, baseball's evaluated both a talent and character for 150 years. Right. And they've still found good players. I mean, even Ty Cobb was, you know, he's kind of a jerk, but boy, can he hit the ball. That was a while ago. Are, are new methods worthwhile? I'm not going to say no, uh, because certainly want to continue to be open-minded to any sort of advancements in any element of player evaluation, whether it's the ball in play stat cast data or it's a psychological evaluation or test that you can provide a player. Uh, you know, it, it, Bill LaJoy, who was a great scout and general manager for many years in mm -hmm. the 80s and, and was actually part of the Red Sox in 04, like he, he was around for a long, long time. He used to evaluate makeup based on one question where you ask a player, where are you going to be in five years? And with sort of more, it seemed like the right answer to Bill was something along the lines of the more grandiose the proclamation from the player, the more he wanted them. Right. I'm going to be an all-star in this league. I'm going to be a household name in this league. I'm going to be part of a world championship team in this league. Whereas opposed to, well, you know, I hope to do what I can, you know, and we'll see how it, how it plays out was a guy he'd stay away from. So Bill had a lot of success using his one question in evaluating amateurs. It doesn't mean it was necessarily the right tack, but it does show that sometimes in simplicity and getting to know an individual, you can boil it down to... Uh, simply how he responds to a single question as opposed to an elaborate test. Now, the NFL and their wonderlick work and right. the stuff they swear by, and, and there's certainly other organizations that uh, have various profile checklists that they look for in interviews. Mm -hmm. Ours isn't as simple as the LaJoy side of things, but we do have a feel for what we're looking for and we sort of know it when we see it. Let's talk a little bit about the clubhouse chemistry that the White Sox have right now. Ricky Renneria has obviously set a lot of things down for these guys. I was in the clubhouse the other day and uh, Aaron Bummer, who was one of the more recent call-ups for the White Sox, pitching out of the bullpen from the left side, he and Mike Pelfrey, who is 35 years old, has been around the league forever, both of them were glued to individually a video game that they, the entire bullpen has been playing. I mean, they are consumed by this thing. And it looks really cool. I kind of want it myself. Uh, but you've got a 35-year-old and a 23-year-old, both of them bonding over something that baseball teams haven't bonded by before, right? I mean, we didn't have a Nintendo Switch in the clubhouse. How, how have players changed since you came into working in baseball? And has it been beneficial to, to kind of grow up yourself kind of with players as they've evolved some? Well, keep in mind, I started as an agent. So right. I used to see behind the curtain of what was really going on. They didn't, I didn't get to see, now I'm on management side. Right, I only right. get to see the Nintendo Switch side of the action. Uh, but no, in reality, I think a lot has changed with how players behave and what they get themselves into based on social media. Now you make one mistake out in a bar or get seen where you shouldn't be and you're pretty much put on blast around yeah. around social media. Uh, now, we've also have gotten closer to a group of guys who are frankly a little more interested when we get to a city, we get off the bus at the hotel and they go upstairs and they play online games against each other out of their rooms, which yes, I'm perfectly do. fine with. <laughs> I, don't, I don't need everybody seen in a church window on Sunday right, morning, but right. if they're gonna stay in it and I'm around the road and play video games, that's fine with me. Uh, makes for a little better performance the next day. Sure. Uh, so that, I think, I think the advent of social media and, and uh, uh, camera phones and everything has changed player behavior to an extent. Uh, I do think, you know, Ricky, you, you, you talk to our clubhouse culture and you talk about guys like Bummer and Pelfrey getting along and working with each other and having fun together. That's been probably the biggest concern I've had and part of why Ricky and his coaching staff have, in my opinion, done such a fantastic job is I don't, I don't even know the number of how many players we've had up this year. I mean, it's got to be 50-something based on the number of trades we've made and the injuries. That's really difficult to convey, to, to continue to have a unified clubhouse because there's so many new faces. Uh, and, frankly, uh, we're a team that's rebuilding. We're a team that's not 
uh, hasn't been in contention much after the first couple of weeks of the season. Many of the players in the clubhouse knew that my name might come up on their caller ID any given night right. and tell them they've been traded. That's a tough environment for any staff to keep a team focused on that night's game. And you've seen, we were talking back there, how many games you've seen personally already this year. I don't think you, you can probably count on one hand those games where it seems like we weren't all there on every given night, that sure. they weren't battling as late and as hard as they could. Yeah, we got blown out a few times, but in terms of battling night in, night out, that is the kind of environment we want and the kind of approach we want, regardless of who's in the 25 uniforms. And that culture, the one that Ricky and the coaches have managed to create this year, despite the turnover, despite the challenges of the turnover, that's the kind of thing that's going to endure. And that's the kind of thing that's going to really benefit us once we get the right core together and they've grown as White Sox. I think uh, one of the things that amazes me most about baseball as it's played right now and as it kind of exists is the bilingual nature of it. Uh, the fact that you've got a manager in Ricky Renteria who is fluent in both English and Spanish, I think is kind of an invaluable, incalculable kind of thing. Um, a number of the guys who primarily speak English or grew up as, with English as their first language have mentioned that Jose Abreu is becoming more and more vocals, probably the right word, in both languages. How important is it to have a clubhouse that, for lack of a better word, can transition through languages like that? Is it necessarily a bad thing that you have... Uh, that, that you may have teams hypothetically where you know Hispanic players are kind of in this corner and English guys are in another English speaking guys or you know English men if you have a couple of those on the team <laughs> cricketeers <laughs> that you've migrated into the league but I, I mean it's it seems like a huge piece of baseball that you know doesn't show up in in box scores at any point I think it's a huge benefit to us and it's part of the reason Ricky's in the position he is is his ability to cross over and teach in, in not just in multiple language, but the ability to connect. Yeah. Uh, having of Mexican descent, having grown up in primarily a Mexican area in Los Angeles, and come to the big leagues uh, through the draft, he's experienced just about every element of what a player ascending to the big leagues was able to exp has experiences these days. Uh, he's also spent a great deal of time in the minor leagues and he's coached at every level there, as has every member of our coaching staff. So there's this level of empathy that comes and understanding that comes with these, what, what these players have gone through. I don't think that teams that perhaps lack that mm -hmm. are at a disadvantage per se. I don't think that it's an insurmountable hurdle that's going to prevent them from winning. But I know our uh, Ricky's ability to communicate across cultures and our coach's ability to teach across cultures helps maximize what we're getting out of our guys. And it is, is a true asset to us and will serve us well in the long run. Uh, that's at the coaching level and is at the player level. Jose wants to be a leader. Jose knows that part of what's slowing him down is his inability to communicate with a portion of the roster. He's worked hard to learn English. Uh, I will say that probably uh, for those outside the clubhouse or didn't have access to the behind the scenes, mm -hmm. it may come as a bit of surprise, but Melky Cabrera was probably the biggest leader in that clubhouse. He was, he's got a tremendous personality. He talked to everybody, English, Spanish, whatever, uh, and was a great joy to be around. So it's not always the ones you expect. It's not necessarily always the biggest name player, the most productive player. Uh, there certainly is a need, though, for those types of players who are willing to follow the tone set by the manager and the coaching staff and sort of build off that culture across cultural divides. Let's talk a little bit about Jose's season. He's uh, been as hot as you could possibly ask for right now. I wrote down a couple of numbers. This is where Jose ranks amongst AL first basemen uh, so far. In average, he's third. In hits, he's second. You probably know all these. In runs, he's first. Doubles, he's first. Triples, he's first. Home runs, he's fourth. RBIs, he's first. Weighted runs created first. Weighted on base average, third. OPS, first. If you missed any of the alphabet soup, you certainly caught the numbers. He's very, very, very good. He's good. What do, you, what do you do with a guy like Jose at the age he's at, with the contract status he's got, knowing that you've got a roster that's very much in transition? How, how does that man fit into the future of the White Sox. It, it seems he could be very much a linchpin. And one, one element you left off, not just the numbers, but when you're, that talking, no, 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 when you're talking his attributes, is the role he plays in that clubhouse, yeah. as you, you mentioned earlier. Uh, there certainly is a very, not just because he picked him up at the airport and helped him order his bats, but those are two examples of the impact that Abreu is having on Moncada. Right. There is a real effect that he has his professionalism, his approach to the game, uh, what he feels is important as a player, 
uh, mirrors a lot of what we feel is important to be a White Sox. There's real value to that. You can't quantify it, but there's real value. At the same time, there's also objective facts that he's under control for two more years, 18 and 19, unless we sign him to an extension. Uh, after the 19 season, or the 2020 season, I believe he'll play at age 33. Uh, which traditionally, especially for right-handed first basemen, tends not to be part of the prime mm -hmm. anymore. It tends to be more towards the downside of a player's career. We have to make the assessment, all things considered, the, the, the weight his runs created to the impact he has on Moncada. Uh, are we better off in terms of when our window realistically opens, whether it's 19 or 20, but certainly goes into the 20s, regardless of when it opens, is that the best use of our resources? a 33, 34, 35 year old right handed first baseman who may be on the decline or that stalwart in the middle of the lineup who's a great team leader. And that's one of the things we're gonna have to assess over the next few months. Uh, we don't have to make that decision this off season since as I said, he's under control for two more, but he's an interesting case. Avi Garcia is another interesting case. Avi is not the same demographic as, as Abreu in that he's 26, and traditionally players tend to peak around 27, 28, so he's probably entering his prime. Uh, however, he is under control only for two more years as well. So we have to make an assessment. Does it make sense to commit whatever tens of millions it will cost to keep Avi, or Avi Garcia off of free agency? Or do we explore perhaps moving him in exchange for continuing this uh, accumulation of prospects that we've done with Players that, quite frankly, were similarly, if not more so, accomplished in Chris Sale and Jose Quintana and even Adam Eaton. There's, there's a connecting line, too, that the White Sox have been able to, to make happen with those kinds of players, too. And I think you probably know where I'm going. The, the ability that you've had to sign Quintana, Eaton, Sale to contracts that were contracts that were very team friendly uh, and netted a little bit back, is, is that a situation where both with Avi and perhaps with Jose, though, like you said, different buckets, is, is that a possibility at points, you know, in this offseason, in next? Can you get, can you split it both ways, I guess? Can you ride that fence with, uh, with an extension that might let you do both down the line? Conceivably, yes. Uh, you don't traditionally get great value on players signing them two years before free agency. Sure. The, the, the deals you alluded to all happened when... Players are only in the league a year, maybe yeah. two years into the league, uh, where they're understandably, from my standpoint, choosing a lifetime of security with that first contract in exchange for giving up a little bit of back end upside, perhaps by giving up a couple of years of free agency control. When players get closer and closer to that free agent payday, they tend not to be quite as willing to sacrifice some of that upside that's only now two seasons away or mm -hmm. if you do it a year before free agency you know only six months of a season away so in theory it's possible it's certainly something that we need to be cognizant of and explore uh, at the same time one of the things that we've been successful at i feel over the past 12 months or eight months however long you want to track this process is we haven't taken any half measures we've been pretty committed to what we've been doing we've been aggressive at least trying to serve the singular goal of putting ourselves in the position to win multiple championships, to acquire as much talent as we possibly can with our short-term assets, and many assets as we can that fit into our long-term plan. Uh, when you have short-term assets still here like Avi and Abreu, you either better turn them into long-term assets via trade or via contract is what it comes down sure. to in the end. That's the decision we're going to have to make. But, I, and, but the sort of straddling it thing, I don't know if that in the end is going to be the route to go. You mentioned that a contract like that, an extension like that early, is a lifetime of security. You guys were able to do that with Tim Anderson over the last offseason. Um, Tim obviously had a, a very difficult first four months in many different ways. Since August, he has been absolutely on fire. I believe the errors have come down too. I think it's two since August 1st. It's the offensive production has been off the charts. Multiple hits in eight of ten games over one streak. Is this the is this the, is this the Tim Anderson that you knew you had, both from a baseball standpoint and from a personality standpoint, from a character standpoint? Uh, yes, on both accounts. And but uh, you know, I think since whenever that Stroman incident took place, I saw some of the day That's before right. I came That's over. Right. When the Stroman thing, since the Stroman incident, he's got an OPS of like 883 or something like that. Which if he maintained that for an entire season as a shortstop. That's remarkable. That, yeah. That's all-star caliber, and that's a fantastic player to have. 
Uh, not saying I expect him to continue to hit 340 or whatever he has since that date throughout the rest of his career, but yes, we, we knew he had that type, of, that type of upside and that sort of talent. From a personal standpoint, we also knew this was the type of person we were dealing with. Right. And in that, is for those of you who don't know, Tim's best friend and godfather of his child was murdered in May uh, back home. And I have personally never, Tim has talked about this publicly. I'm not yes. telling any tales. Uh, I have never seen a, a player more affected by an off the field incident than, I, than Tim was. And he wasn't sleeping. He, he was sleepwalking through his days. And you saw it on the field. Yeah. Uh, he, to his credit, he's talked publicly about the fact he sought out some counseling. He's received help. He's not, you know, 100% better psychologically, but he's he's improved. And I think you've seen obviously the performance improve as well. But before we enter into a contract with any of these guys on a long-term basis, part is getting to know who they are and is the money going to change how they approach things? Is the money going to change what they care about? Are they going to feel like they've arrived because they got that first fortune banked, or are they going to still be hungry? So we certainly knew what we were getting in terms of Tim Anderson, the person, before we made the commitment. And part of what we knew we were getting is someone who is extremely caring about his family, about those close to him. Obviously, we couldn't foresee someone he cared that much about you know, uh, suffering this tragedy. Uh, but we knew this was the individual we were getting and the individual we wanted to be part of this next core when we, when we signed him up for the next eight seasons. Uh, certainly, we, we, Tim, through his sensitivity and his, his caring about his family and his friends, his, you know, suffered some hardships this year, but the player you've seen over the last couple of months, I think, is much more similar to what uh, we project seeing going forward. We got a couple minutes left, uh, and you guys traveled all the way down here to see Rick and hang out with us in a space that has hosted. I wrote this down actually. Uh, you have in this, or we have here at WLS, seen uh, Panic at the Disco, Green Day, Jimmy Eat World, Kevin Bacon has a band. He was in here a little while ago. And uh, I got to tell you, this is way better than any of that I was stuff. Say, that is so much cooler than me. what it is. Like, that Offspring, list is awesome. dashboard. Uh, I but would you guys not came add down my name here to that list. <laughs> for this. And uh, if you have questions, if you just want to um, pile up in this general aisle here, and if you want to ask a question, you're more than, nope, I take that back. We have a microphone over there. And if you have a question, you can go stand by Dave. Uh, he's the executive producer of White Sox Baseball, and you can pop a question in. Otherwise, uh, we will plow through here. Uh, Brendan I got Gailey. a question. <laughs> All right, so going back to the Quintana trade, yes. somehow you guys kept that secret didn't leak at all to any of these savvy reporters. How the hell did you do that? I wish I knew the answer to that one, because that was awesome. That was so, I, I'm not going to lie to you, that was so satisfying. We, we, <laughs> we, we rarely call a guy up from Charlotte without it hitting social media before we're willing to put out a press release. Our, our Scott Reifer, our VP of Communications, is sitting in the back. And I don't, no disrespect to the job his people do, but it always leaks. Uh, with the Quintana trade, it's funny, actually, because it, it, we got to the point where we were getting ready to call the players. It hadn't leaked yet, so we're within you know a half hour being able to release it. And the Cubs had gotten hold of all four of their guys. I still couldn't get a hold of Q. Uh, we had one of the guys in the front office trying to reach him as well. Hey, Rick's going to call. You need to pick up the phone. And I got a text from one of our beat reporters. It said, Q to the Cubs, question mark. Then I got a text from another reporter saying, Eloy to you guys, question mark. And I'm like, oh, I'm not going to swear. I almost did. Uh, I'm like, oh, this is starting to leak. Then Q calls. And so, you know, I've, I've known Quintana since the first day we signed him with the White Sox. And, and, you know, he is just a fantastic individual. And as I alluded to earlier, our scouts, our player development people, our major league staff all love this guy for what he's meant to us. And losing him hurts. So Q calls and I explain to him what's going on and then you know you can tell he's emotional it's a big day for him and he sort of wants to chat and he's like Rick you know everything you guys have done for me and, and like phone's starting to buzz and I'm like no way I am losing this scoop just because of, for my love of Q and I'm like hey Jose I love you good luck I'll see you next week when we play you guys I gotta go hang up and I text Scott and they let the thing release and it actually we actually still were managed to to beat the leak on that uh, I think both teams deserve a lot of credit, not just for the fact that we're able to keep it to a small circle and keep it quiet, because uh, obviously something of that magnitude leaking out early leads to a great deal of analysis and second guessing and could possibly influence 
that deal coming together if it sees the light of day early. And uh, you know, I know uh, I know Theo and his people, and certainly on our side, felt that it was wonderful that both sides were able to put aside any noise or any distraction and do what was a good baseball deal for both sides that made sense for where both teams were in terms of their win cycles. Uh, and I don't know if it had seen the light of day and it had been debated for 48 hours before the deal finally got done, if that still would have been the case. I like to think it would have been, but I liked it this way better. Next time, tell Connor so we get the scoop. Done. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Connor was here. texting. We've been like, yeah, totally. <laughs> I just, <laughs> just go with it. <laughs> send him an emoji. Just ask that way. To to that end, the uh, the Yankees trade also kind of just. Um, oh, we got another. Okay, we'll go we'll go here instead. Sorry, Connor. No, that's <laughs> please. Uh, thanks. Uh, by the way, this has been the most fun sixty win uh, team to watch. Uh, probably ever so good work here thank you very touched on earlier very exciting um going forward requiring starting pitching um as the the years go on this rebuild continues is are you looking can be looking more to the draft or kind of building position players and going free agency for first to kind of flesh out this starting pitching i mean you got a lot in the pipeline obviously but i don't know the answer to that yet simply because we have through this you know first phase or however you want to describe it Mm -hmm accumulated a lot like I, I could sit here and tell you we project for 2020 or whatever these are our three outfielders and if I'm wrong about any of these three here are the next here are the next three behind them and then there's a few behind them too all of whom are credible prospects and and realistically could be part of a championship club if they develop and hit their ceilings but until we go through this sort of next year year and a half I'm not really going to be confident enough to tell you yeah that guy's going to very likely hit his ceiling. This guy's not, sure. but this guy behind him is, or this guy behind him isn't. So we have to go out and get somebody else. We know what we do know is a couple of things. One, they're not all going to hit their ceilings. Unfortunately, they're not all going to be the studs that you could sit here today and project them to be. Right. Unfortunately, my job would be way easier if that were the case. <laughs> the second thing we know is that dallying in the free agent market is going to be the next, the final stage of this, because there's going to be holes somewhere. You may, we may address it via trade. We may find out that we've got seven viable starting pitchers and we're going to move one of those for the third baseman we lack or whatever. Sure. Uh, or we may decide we're going to need to go out and spend money on that third baseman or whatever position is, is lacking because the development didn't quite come the way we wanted. Uh, so I can't tell you today who's going to come from where, but I can tell you we're going to let these guys develop and they're going to answer it for us and then we're going to have to be aggressive via trade or free agency to fill in the gaps. Sounds good. As the need uh, presents itself. So, thanks. Uh, that said, as far as starting pitching goes, uh, you guys have you, you made a move this year to pick up Derek Holland. And I would imagine, and I think Derek knew this too, that the idea might have been to move him on to another squad if that's if he pitched well. Didn't happen. Uh, and that's that happens when you do that kind of thing. Is that still an opportunity as, as years go on here to pick up, whether it's starting pitching or other positions, pieces that you can then kind of move around sign and trades a little course I guess but sign and trades a little course but that's or flipping is the other way to describe it maybe course course even more course uh, but that is part of where we're at sure that's and team players know that Derek Holland uh, chose to come to us even knowing where we were as an organization because he wanted to one ideally get through the year healthy for the first time in a right. while right and he felt Herm Schneider could help that and he wanted to also work with Don Cooper as our pitching coach so he knew Despite the fact that if things went really well for Derek Holland personally, he was probably going to be in another uniform August 1st, uh, he felt this was the best way to sort of maximize his future. Unfortunately, it didn't quite work out. Uh, certainly, until we get to the point where we're actually blocking prospects that need to be in Chicago, uh, that remains on the table, whether it's in the bullpen, like you saw with Anthony, Anthony Schwarzak this right. year. Uh, Miguel Gonzalez was a two year control guy, but. Mm-hmm fit that mold as well, or, or, or Holland, as you alluded to. Uh, we're not going to go out and sign a second baseman. We've got a second baseman who needs to play in Moncada. But there are other positions where we, we may well be looking to do that again this offseason. Take another one here from the uh, audience. Sure. Yeah, um, one of the things uh, I saw this season, there seemed to be a lot of injuries, a lot of players going to the DL. Um, Rodon, specifically, is that more of a case that you've got these young players and you're just being really overprotective and making sure that you're really taking the safe route given it's a rebuilding year? And do you have concerns going forward with, you know, the, the, the Rodons, the Nate Jones, Lopez? Because it seems like there's a lot more ob- lat strains and oblique muscle strains that 
first really never hit the radar until it happened to Peavy back three, four years ago. So if you can comment on yeah, that, that'd be great. A couple different things there are at play. First, the, the Lopez situation showing you that no good deed goes unpunished. We had, a, we had a night game at Dodger Stadium, and Lopez was scheduled to pitch the next night in, in Arlington against the Rangers. So being the good guys that we are, we got him a flight out of LAX at like 4 p.m. so he didn't have to arrive with us at 5 in the morning before his start. Uh, Lopez, when he was at DFW, picked up his bag and felt a grab on the side there. So that's how he got hurt. Uh, next time he can be sleep deprived and pitch healthy instead. Uh, you, with, the, with the number of DL placements, you are seeing a couple of factors. One, Major League Baseball this year, the collective bargaining agreement reduced the minimum stay from 15 to 10 days. When you're talking about a starting pitcher and you might have an off day in there, you're kind of talking about one start and we're not going to screw around when you can only when a guy only has to miss a start we're not going to mess around if there's any question as to his health especially with a young player like lopez lopez probably could have made his next start instead of going on the dl but not going to again we're not going to mess around with that which goes to the larger issue when you're dealing with uh, uh, rodan or any of these guys uh, given where we are as a, as a club right now we're not going to just shoot a guy up and send him back out there and hope that you know, we win an extra game or two over the course of the final three, four weeks of the season. Instead, as is the case of Carlos, let's set him down, explore whatever we need to explore to try to get him right for the long term as opposed to taking any short-term risks. Rick, I suppose that's as good a place as any to wrap things up. Really appreciate you coming down, and thanks to all of you for uh, listening to the post-game show and coming down for this. I, I, I certainly appreciate it, and you can hear all of it and enjoy the rest of the season right here on WLS. So thanks so much for coming out. <laughs> And, and, and Rick, you'll just, have to, uh, you'll just have to live with not being perhaps the center of attention at the, at the winter meetings coming up in November. Right. I look forward to it. Something you'll have to. <laughs> Thanks again to Rick Hahn and to Thank Scott you. Ryford and the White Sox.